Well, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Shellen McCoy, and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, I'd just like to say thank you uh, for being here with us today and for today's webinar. Uh, we always like to say thank you to Governor of Canada uh, because uh, they're contribution helps us, enables us to do uh, sessions like we're doing today. Uh, for today's webinar, uh, and also as our last one of the series, is uh, Brian Cavell. So Brian, welcome. I'm really glad you're here. Um, just a little bit on Brian. Um, Brian is a fisheries biologist at the Department of Natural Resources and Energy Development with the Government of New Brunswick. Uh, he undertook his bachelor's at the University of New Brunswick and his master's degree in Edinburgh Napier University in Scotland, UK. Having worked on three different continents, Brian has a diverse knowledge of biology, particularly pertaining to fish. After having spent the majority of his career on Vancouver Island in BC, working with Pacific salmon, he has returned home to use his skills in his home province of New Brunswick. Today, he is here to explain the importance of angler surveys in the place he now calls home again. So uh, he'll gonna be speaking today on the importance of the angler surveys and managing New Brunswick fisheries together. Uh, after the presentation today, we're, we will allow some time for questions and answers and I'll help moderate that and I'll explain how we're gonna do that once we get to that point. But uh, now just to start, uh, Brian, welcome. And uh, I'm just gonna pass it on to you for you to do your presentation. So you can go right ahead. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much and for that wonderful introduction. Uh, like you said, my name is Brian Koval. I'm a fisheries biologist, Department of Natural Resources here in New Brunswick, and very pleased to speak to you all today about something I hold near and dear to my heart, and that's, of course, the importance of angler surveys uh, and how we're managing New Brunswick fisheries together. And I hope by the end of the presentation, you will also see the importance of angler surveys. So, First of all, um, like was mentioned before, I'm still relatively new back to New Brunswick. So just a, a quick background here. Originally, I'm actually from Quispamsis, uh, but I spent my majority of my career working for the Peninsula Stream Society on Vancouver Island, where I was working as a rich freshman biologist, doing things like uh, restoring habitat for wildlife, teaching students, assessing fish populations, among other activities. That being said, I have also worked in New Brunswick. I worked at Machias Seal Island for Tony Diamond, uh, working with Atlantic puffins. Uh, see the cute little puffins staring up you from the bag there. Uh, and I also worked for the DFO in St. Andrews. So again, very pleased to be here today and uh, let's just get on with the show. So just a brief agenda here. I've um, got some topics to cover. Gonna start with the brief history of recreational fishing followed by some of the unnatural pressures of being a fish, possibly some you haven't thought of before, um, assessment techniques that we use as biologists here in the province. Um, and then we'll get into the, the meat of the whole presentation, which is the angler surveys, which I call the people's data, which you're gonna find out more once I get to that part of the presentation. Um, with the knowledge we have of the over past century or so, we'll talk about how the New Brunswick fisheries have been changing and just end on a positive note how we can move forward together. So sit back and enjoy. So I just want to start this presentation with a slide just to get people thinking about what lurks beneath. This is a photo of Loch Ness, a place to spend some time in when I was in Scotland, so I thought it was appropriate. And one of those lakes that's so mysterious, you know, with the critters like, uh, you know, that may or may not exist. But Let's talk about what lurks beneath. It's not a new question. Sometimes we see things jump or wash up, giving us a glimpse into the world beneath. But far back in our history, uh, we've been searching, well, for food, for entertainment, and to simply know more. Again, uh, looking beneath the surface is nothing new. These are artist depictions used to carry some of my points here. Uh, Mesopotamia on the top left, they were fishing when the first known written story was ever created, the, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Ancient Egypt, they were fishing before stone was placed for the ancient pyramids. China, they were using corns for a long, long time. Ancient Greece, they were fishing before the first emperor even rose to power. Fishing is nothing new. 
But fishing is certainly not new on the east coast of North America either. Now this photo here is an artist's depiction of fishing in New York State, not too far geographically from here. Could not find one of them, unfortunately. But I just want you to note the different fishing techniques that we still use today. But now we're gonna jump forward to the late 1800s where things appear to become more recreational. People were still fishing for food. It was quite clear that these folks are fishing for leisure. So let's jump ahead to today. I'm just joking, of course. This is an artist's depiction of what life was supposed to be like in the 2000s, being able to walk on water with balloons. I'll tell you one thing, I'm pretty happy we stuck to improving our fishing techniques. And this is a real today, just a great photo. It's an activity for the whole family. Uh, traditions that have been passed on for generations are still being passed on today. Um, but that being said, gear has improved, it's become specialized. Research and fishing by trial and error has led to better fishing techniques. Availability internet allows for faster research, although some false information, so be careful out there. Uh, and power boats allow us to get places faster, access places faster, and generally catch fish faster. Uh, not to mention fish finders make things a bit easier as well. So some of you may disagree, but fishing has become easier in my opinion. For example, this is a little embarrassing, but as a fisheries biologist, I'm not that great of an angler. That being said, I'm able to watch videos online, go buy the gear, uh, go to suggested spots from the internet I found, and yes, me, even me, can go out there and have a really good day of fishing. So essentially, things become easier, we're catching more fish. Um, that's not saying that there's the same amount of fish available today. So um, now there's lots of people, more people around the world, and there's more people out fishing with uh, the ability to catch lots of fish really quick. So it's becoming increasingly more important that we monitor our populations to ensure they're there for our future generations. As well, uh, some people are catching a ton of fish really quick illegally. This is a photo from the States, but fractions remain similar here. This article is great because it's a testament to what can happen when you poach. We need more cases like this to sort of deter people and hold them accountable for their actions to make it so it's less likely they'll try that sort of thing again. So if you do encounter poaching or suspicion of poaching, please contact one of the following so you can help us catch some of these folks. Throughout this presentation, I will have some information and contact information for different places. Um, I will be going through it pretty quickly. So if you do uh, want any of it after the presentation, I'm happy to do that as well. So the pressures aren't restricted to poaching and ease of recreational fishing. Uh, there's also commercial fishing where we can catch a ton of fish really fast, including the wrong fish uh, during bycatch. The more fish caught at a time, generally the more fish can suffer. It's important to monitor this type of fishing as it is a ton of fish being caught quickly. So thankfully to the DFO who uh, for their efforts for monitoring in this sector. So we affect fish by more ways than by fishing for them. And I'll show you. Um, there's also, um, we call this uh, construction, um, removal of shoreline habitat, riparian destruction in a nutshell. This greatly degrades the shoreline habitat as well as the water bodies, increases runoff, uh, warms water as it moves across the surface, removes shade, and removes the vegetation that you normally see along the banks, which drops material into the water, which invertebrates eat. It also drops invertebrates into the water, or they fall in, which the small fish eat, and pass it up the food chain. So it's an incredibly important resource that we have to make sure we maintain. And there's also hard shoreline structures. This is something that people don't always think about, but essentially these hard structures do protect our infrastructure. What happens is when the waves hit the walls, the energy has to go somewhere. So it ends up eroding the beach. And that's unfortunate because fish like Pacific herring and sand lance, which I worked with out in BC, actually use the beach in order to spawn. So these structures are actually literally removing uh, spawning material. Um, to mitigate this, options are um, sloping the bank instead and putting in vegetation, which looks better and helps dissipate some of that power and is more naturalized. There's also things like oil spills and other incidents that can wipe out fish in a creek. This is Mackay Creek in North Van, 
and essentially it can just be very bad for fish populations. If you do find an oil spill out there from a car, oil, heating tank, or otherwise, you can call the LG at the numbers listed here. I then stayed on my phone because when I'm out and about and I see something, it makes it so I can report more quickly, so that action can be taken more quickly. And just imagine if all the people out fishing were also looking for these things, uh, we could catch a lot of these incidents a, a lot quicker. So you may think that I've gotten off topic a bit, but what I really want you to consider is the fact that there's many dangers for fish out there uh, that are directly related to us. And it becomes our responsibility to manage these fish as these activities are not likely to stop, although we may reduce them or help mitigate them. And with all, so just um, with all of that, um, and all the reasons being we want to maintain our fishery for future generations and things along those lines, um, I want to bring up another point which is important to other people. And that is the economy, which is incredibly here important here in New Brunswick. Uh, there's about 66,000 licensed anglers a year, about 850,000 angler days, meaning a day where an angler is out fishing, about 200 licensed outfitters. Um, the economic contribution to New Brunswick is over $50 million annually, quite significant. But I also want you to think about this. Revenue to local businesses, lodges, hotels, tackle shops, outfitters, and all outs. This is from the out-of-towners, um, the out-of-provincers, the out-of-nationers, whatever, whoever it may be. We're bringing people into these towns who are coming to go fishing, which of course brings indirect um, money into your community. And again, fishing is an important component of New Brunswick tourism. People come here to fish and they end up seeing the other sites, staying at our hotels and using their money ways um, yeah okay move on so now I'm going to guide you through some of the techniques that we use as biologists to assess our populations here in New Brunswick and you'll see that this is fisheries independent and, and that means that we're not relying on the fishermen uh, for the data so Backpack electrofishing uh, kind of looks like you're a ghostbuster. A lot of fun to haul around, but uh, really effective. Um, it's able to stun fish, so you're able to collect them, count them, weigh them, measure them, you name it, and assess the population of that particular site. And it's great because DFO also does this in the province, as well as NGOs and others. And we really have cast a, a wide net here. Um, it allows us to monitor changes over time and it allows us to advise on management um, from that data. And I just want to show you the GNB electrofishing sites from around the province. As you can see, there's quite a bit of coverage here. Uh, certainly keeps our staff busy and this coverage allows us to monitor sites throughout the province. However, this mostly pertains to smaller fish, which includes juvenile salmon. Very important to all of us. Uh, and just some pictures of some electrofishing boats because uh, sometimes you can't uh, <laughs> walk out into the middle of a lake with a backpack. So these boats come in quite handy. The DFO's boat on the top left and CRI's on the, the bottom left there. And on the right, you'll see actually our team, that's Catherine, my boss, and a couple of our technicians looking at fish and uh, assessing um, population at that particular area. So uh, there's other more passive ways that we look for fish and that's by netting. Um, there's minnow traps, seine nets, and these are bike nets. I put these orange balls on here to represent the buoys to give you an idea of how these nets work. Uh, the wings are out. And so that guides the fish into the trap here where you will collect them as biologists like you see in the picture here. And this can be quite hard work especially when you get something like 700 white perch in one of these things. Um, I do want to note these traps are great for catching brood stock, which we use for our hatchery program, um, which we use to stock around the province. Uh, there's also barriers and fences, which are great for counting migrating fish, like our wonderful Atlantic salmon. Essentially, they all have to get to the fence and they're collected and moved over the fence. So we have an idea of exactly how many fish and when are moving through that system. Um, go to the next slide. This is just an example. Any data I show today is very high level. We're not going to go into any specific detail, but just to give you an idea of what we can use it for. And this is at the Dungarvan barrier. 
and total salmon per year. And because this goes back to the 80s, it allows us to look at different trends. In particular, um, if we see any issues in the current day, we could look back in time and uh, maybe make some sense out of it. But that's that for now. So really what I want you to do is think about the sheer scale of management in New Brunswick of our fisheries. There's about 1,400 named lakes and ponds and 1,000 that are unnamed. There's three. 3,800 named rivers, brooks, streams, and creeks having a total length of approximately 60,000 kilometers. That's like driving here to Vancouver Island in British Columbia like 11 times, over 11 times. That's 20,000 kilometers longer than the circumference of the earth. It's a lot of ground to cover. I mean, water to cover. So luckily for us, we have recreational fishing areas, which is a great strategy. It allows us to separate the different watersheds as populations and species vary between them, sometimes wildly. It allows us to make regulations specific to certain situations of those RFAs. And this is a map I wanted to show you of all the water bodies from our GIS. Obviously, this isn't all water. The things are expanded a bit. But if you see the dark blue, it's likely going to be a lake or a concentration of rivers or streams that have merged together. But essentially, the, the idea is just look at the scope here. It's, it's a lot to cover. Oh, sorry about that. There we go. Um, so essentially, we can't be everywhere at once. Our resources will only get us so far. Thankfully, there are ways to complement our data where we can work with the community and build a better data set together. The data can only go as far as we make it go together, and we can only make it as relevant as possible when we work together. This is why I call it the people's data. So there are many ways that people's data can be acquired. Let's explore some of those together. And now you'll see I've called this fisheries dependent uh, because we do depend on the fisheries, fisher people like you. So we get great data from our crown lease and reserves, um, which serves a great conservation tool and are a long running tradition in the province. Uh, crown leases and crown reserves um, are great because there's no infringement on Aboriginal or treaty rights. Um, so the conservation tool, like I mentioned, um, data reporting is a requirement. Um, there's acceptable use. You need to follow strict rules there usually. And it's big on fairness as it's based on a lottery system for the reserves and an auction basis for the leases. Um, benefits um, of the, to you, I should say, is basically you get to go to these beautiful places where there's solitude, few people around, and you're likely to see fish. So I just think it's a great program where we get to see that data and we can make decisions on that data over time. Yeah, and you have to throw a couple salmon in there because uh, yeah, they're fun to catch. And here's an example of what you can do with that data. This is from the Tapusintak uh, lease who submit their data annually and apologize for uh, butchering that word. But um, anyway, this is for Atlantic salmon caught per day where people are present in fishing. It gives you an idea of how easy or hard it is to catch fish. As you can see, there's ups and downs. But because we have the historic data, we have something to compare the data to um, in terms of trends. Now, another way we get data from the people um, is from uh, our blue bar, our blue bard, pro, our blue card program. Um, essentially, a creel survey done by our hardworking COs and rangers. There they are. There you can just see how hard they're working. And uh, these cards are appropriately named. They're um, blue. And allows us to collect information on species, uh, what are caught, how many, how big, um, things along this line. And as you can see from this data map, there's some massive coverage. And these folks do get around uh, the province um, to get us this important data. And the data can be presented in a few ways, including, oh, they're there again, um, from a New Brunswick scale, if you want to look at the whole province, um, just as reference. Harvest rating refers to how easy it is to catch a fish um, for those who are keeping them, where the release is the opposite. Um, but if you were wanted to know something more in particular in terms of an RFA, 
you could zoom in and have a look at the Miramichi RFA. But if you were more focused on a subwatershed or a tributary, or something like that, um, we can do that as well to see if the issue resides there. We also have uh, tournament creel data um, where organizers of official some of the best tournaments where variation orders are required. Um, uh, these folks in these tournaments are required to submit their data annually so we can monitor these activities over time. And uh, of course, just another good way to get some data. Now it's time for the direct people's data, the data. When we go fishing, we should report our data. When you go fishing, report your data. You can be a part of helping manage the wonderful fish in Brunswick. By doing so, you give us an idea of where and when fish are being caught, which helps us assess populations all over the province. You can enter it online or by mailing in a page from your guidebook, which I'll show you here in a minute, and it'll keep track of things over the years, and you'll have your own personal record of your fish caught over time. No more losing that old fishing book and uh, losing all your information. Okay, so now um, you may recognize this from the center of your Angling Regs book. I sure hope you remember walking to your mailbox and putting them in every year for the past few decades, unless you do it online, of course. What I want to do now is tell you why this is so important. There's many reasons, and we'll sort of tackle it one at a time. So. Our department occasionally gets letters to the minister from citizens concerned about fish populations in their area. I applaud this dedication and concern for our precious fish species. However, these letters arrive often without data, uh, mostly hearsay in terms of research. On top of that, the folks submitting the letters have not submitted their own data to us, so we don't even have any information regarding their specific concerns. We need data to prove what is happening. Similar to a lawyer having to prove things in court, you know, you may not put someone away on hearsay. So for us to make a case to reduce bag limit, shorten season, reduce sizes to retain, or another measure like this, we simply need data. Not just this year's media data, we need data over years to determine trends, a robust data set to complement our other assessment methods. For example, we had 50 years of this continuous data for a watershed, we could determine if something is a natural pattern or something new that we should be concerned about. On top of that, it could let us know more about the concern and uh, see if it warrants immediate action. We'd really have a pulse on the province, have a better idea of what's going on here and there. This, ta-da, is the online portal. Um, with uh, my outdoors card number just blanked out so no one can go in and uh, say that I caught a tuna in the St. John River. Anyway, um, it's very easy to enter and very easy friendly. I like to enter mine after each outing. I treat it as a sort of fishing log. As you can see, I do not get out as much as I like to, but I'm able to keep track of all my trips, remember where and when I caught a fish, just in case I want to go back and help someone else catch a similar fish in that area. You'll also see that there is nowhere to put in your exact uh, location, AKA your favorite fishing spot, your honey hole. That is because we do not want to know where that spot is. We are looking for the fishing data for that general area, which is also more reasonable in terms of setting regulations. We're not going to show up at your honey hole, for example, and make up new special regulation just for you there in that spot. It's far too much work, for example. So, but seriously, we are more interested in overall populations, which are likely moving between areas. So it is quite important to us. And as you can see, uh, again, just very easy to enter this information and simply so important to us. Um, I often hear people saying they don't think we do anything with the data. Then I find out they have never submitted their data. How are we meant to do something with data if it is not given in the first place? I've also heard people say, why start now? I've also heard dieters say the same thing. And the answer is the same for both. It's never too late. Start now and make it routine, make it happen. If you shot a deer or moose, would you not want to report it? So just looking at... Uh, how many of these surveys we get a year. It's only about 3% of anglers who submit their data and not necessarily for all their trips. Why is this so low? Don't know. 
We've tried giving away prizes and other incentives, but with no real increase in submissions. We also worry about getting garbage data when offering prizes as people will simply um, want to get one of those entries. Essentially, we need people to understand why the data is used, make them understand the importance, and then they themselves will decide to give accurate data as they feel it is important. So what would make people share? They are overly keen to share their fish on Facebook, but not with an organization whose goal it is to maintain the healthy fishery into the future. It takes the same amount of time and you'll be taking a stake in this incredibly important resource. Not just bragging rights on the internet, because you know we all do that. So um, I do a bit of a plug just before we move on quickly here. Um, when you are out fishing and you find a fin clipped fish, uh, please report it as well. We clip adipose and pelvic fins at the hatchery on a rotation so we know the age of the landlocked salmon or brook, brook trout that we stocked. Reports of these numbers help our savvy stocking biologists make important decisions about where and when to stock. So again, please share that information when you're out and about. So now we're gonna skip back to the late 1800s here, or uh, early 1900s. So what was the fishery like back then? Again, just another old recreational fishing photo. Saw the Lady Beaverook, anyway. So in the early 1900s, First Nations, other residents of the province fished for food. New Englanders also traveled here by train to angle for fish. The two preferred species were of course, Atlantic salmon and brook trout. And since very few people fished and it was difficult to access deep woods areas, fishing was good. Back to June what? Newspapers in London, England around this time were giving fishing reports of Canadian angling. By 1990, the fishery was more diverse. There's a greater interest in species such as landlocked salmon and smallmouth bass. Smallmouth bass, which were moved here in late 1800s from down south, um, which essentially have become populations. Um, the number of anglers uh, had peaked back then and catching was not as good as it used to be. Um, but of course, um, fishing techniques had improved. Uh, road access had increased though into these deep woods area um, and invasive species were grown in numbers and spread all over the place. Today, we have a fishery that has changed significantly over the past 120 years or so. Um, the interest is a list of fish species um, diverse and has increased. Um, essentially, there's just a lot more different types of fish, particularly ones that people are fishing for. And if you skip ahead to the future, no doubt that recreational fishery will be even more diverse, especially if we um, do not collectively manage the resource and its use. So we're just suggesting that we manage the direction of the change and the speed of the change. And we essentially have that collective responsibility. Now, um, just uh, to touch base on some of those invasive species I was mentioning, the, the in introduced species. Um, they have a series of negative effects on ecosystems. Uh, they're a threat to native species and biodiversity, altering habitat, competing for food and space, like you see here from our poor Atlantic salmon and brook trout. They predate, uh, particularly on smaller fish, and they can spread new diseases, and as well as provide genetic effects if hybridization is possible. Really what it comes down to is preventative action is the way to go. Make sure they don't get there in the first place because once they do, um, you've seen what happens with smallmouth bats populations, for example. Here's just the list of some other intrusive species you can look out for. My big plug here is just don't move them. And if you know any rumors or you have photo evidence or anything along the lines of that of people moving these fish, um, always interested here because we need to build a case for these things if we're gonna prevent it happening into the future. And if you do find these species, feel free to report one of these wonderful organizations. I tend to just pick one to make it so that I'm always reporting to the same one, but it's good to have saved in your phone. So if you are out in a new spot fishing and you do notice one of these things, we do wanna hear about it. Just to go back, uh, just two slides. I just wanna point out the zebra mussels. Definitely keep an eye out for those ones. Now, just to go back to where we started, what lurks beneath. We know a lot more now, but there's certainly a lot more to know. There's changes happening all the time over time. 
So essentially, again, what we're looking for is the pulse of the province to know where and when things are happening so we can have a nice, healthy fishery into the future. And what can you do to help again? Be a good steward of this wonderful province we're in. You can do things like report your catch, get others to report the catch, follow the regulations in the guidebook, very important. They're there for a reason. Uh, report clipped fish, uh, report any poaching, report invasive species, as well as reporting those pollution events. If we're out there, um, we might as well help if we had the opportunity. Finally, just a quick plug of uh, Fish New Brunswick Day. Maybe this presentation got you all amped up to go fishing once we can get back out there. Well, um, Fish New Brunswick Day is great. You don't need a license. You can get someone who is new to fishing to see if they like it or just go out and enjoy it with your family. Uh, two opportunities during February and June. Hope to see you out there. Now with that, uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the employees at GMB and DNR for your commitment to the betterment of our province. Special thanks to my branch, Fish and Wildlife, for your support and inspiration. And finally, special thanks to you for your interest. Together, we can build a better New Brunswick. And I hope after today, you have a better understanding of why these angler surveys are just so important. So thanks for tuning in. And uh, it was great speaking with you today. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for taking the opportunity to come and share that information uh, today with everybody that's online and those that hopefully will come later uh, to watch it on our YouTube because it is recorded. Um, but before we end today, we always like to give the opportunity for questions and answers. Um, for those that have not joined our webinar series before, the way we go about that is that you can raise your hand uh, and then be unmuted and ask your questions yourself. Uh, for those that uh, cannot do it that way or are a little bit too shy to speak out loud, you can always type it all in and I will uh, be my pleasure to read out loud for you for Brian to answer. So um, we'll give you a, a minute here to, uh, to see if there's any questions. Don't be shy. You heard me stumble over all those words. No pressure. <laughs> Let's see. I think your information was so clear that no question. That's great. Yeah. Right. Uh, and if something happens, someone thinks of a question after the fact when we're over, Brian has indicated that he is open for anybody that wants to reach out and email. Uh, and uh, he'll he'd be happy to, to answer uh, to the best uh, visibilities. So yeah, always happy to help. Yeah, I'll keep watching here, but uh, to see if someone pops with a question. Um, but this is actually our, our last webinar of the 2022-2023 series. Um, we had 10 webinar sessions, so thank you, Brian. You're closing our closing up the session here today, and uh, it was wonderful. Um, the next series that we're going to do is going to start uh, in September of 2023. We always go from September to March. Uh, so what I like to mention, and also we're going to try to do in our communications too, is that we always look for key topics that people really want more information on. So if anybody uh, have any ideas or something you really want to know more of, uh, please let us know, and uh, we'll find the right person to speak on that subject and that topic and make it available to you here in our next series so I just wanted to put that suggestion there up out there um, but apart from that uh, I just want to say another warm uh, thank you to Brian uh, to all the presenters that have presented here uh, in the last little bit and for all those that join us today uh, to come hear the information uh, so thank you to everybody and I wish everybody a great day thank you for the opportunity see you later yeah Brian